is helping to direct the advocacy work that's going to happen. For younger children who can't direct an advocate, so that could be a baby, maybe a toddler who um, can't express what they want or don't want, or even in some circumstances, maybe a young person where um, something's happening where they don't have the capacity to really understand the implications of all the decisions that are being made. Um, we do work on the sort of non-directed side. We're really an advocate when they're looking at doing their advocates is looking at what are all the rights that that young person has? What are the, all the things that they're entitled to receive in a certain system? And are those things happening for that young person? And if not, is there an advocacy issue or issues that that advocate then needs to try and take forward to get addressed? Um, we are always trying to bring forward the voice or viewpoint of young people. And that includes very young children. I've been around long enough. We've really evolved but changed our practice over time so when I first started in our office almost 20 years ago we actually had where we didn't we might get a referral for a young person under the age of 12 but we wouldn't necessarily ever call that young person an advocate might do a whole bunch of work look at their file see that maybe they're not getting um, some kind of medical support that they should be and then they would go after it We've really pushed the envelope around children's rights and that idea that young, young people of all ages can have a viewpoint to some capacity. And so an advocate might not be taking direction from a six-year-old, but they will always still be trying to bring forward what does that young person have to say about what's important to them. Um, and their viewpoint and, and try to be very creative around how they do that. Um, one of the strategies a lot of our advocates use, even with older kids sometimes, is um, draw me a picture of who's important in your life. Who really is important? Who do you want to make sure you you keep connected to? Who? And then tell me about your picture. Any guesses what shows up in pictures as really important, aside from family maybe or friends? Any guesses? Get thrown in chat or unmute. And I don't qu ask questions for trick questions, just to get you to think about it. Something that's really important to kids that maybe we don't always think about. I can tell you. Um, pets. And so... If you've been around the children's services world for a very long time, kids move a lot. Kids move all the time. But do we ever think about all of the attachments kids have to school, friends, community, and then also to pets or animals? And so we really try what shows up in pictures children draw. So family often, right? Family, siblings, could be um, whoever... It could be uh, like cook them, aunties, and then lots of pets, um, school friends, sort of a mix. But, um, and so advocates sort of, it's this whole continuum. Our work isn't really black and white, but it's all about trying to make sure that all the rights are on the table, their voice or whatever viewpoint, what kids want to say is really important to them is being considered and then they have the opportunity to tell decision makers about it or if they're not able to tell decision makers then we support and tell decision makers whenever possible for older kids really because they're directing our work the issues we go after are the only the ones that they want us to go after and so behind the scenes, but we are telling young people all of their rights, all the things they're potentially entitled to. But if a young person doesn't want to pursue a particular issue because they're our client and we're directed by them, we can't go after that issue. So a good example might be, and this has actually happened, 
they currently have nowhere to live. And we know this and we, and as in a, like as someone trying to support them, that is very concerning, but it might be that the only issue they want us to help them with at that moment in time is getting funding to get another bike so they can get from place to place. And they say, nope, I don't want you to go after the fact that I don't have anywhere to live. We, we still are hoping that the people who are making decisions are still going after that issue. But for us with older kids, because we take direction, we wouldn't necessarily go after that issue. Um, the common themes, I just saw the roll up from last year. And for those of you who sort of work with lots of, I don't like the word vulnerable, but young people who often are not getting all of the things they need or involved with big government systems, the theme, the big themes that we saw in our individual advocacy, number one was placement. I don't think this is a surprise. Uh, lack of places for kids to live. Um, lots of um, young people who are unhoused in a real lack of um, appropriate places for kids to live. And um, and so that was sort of the number one um, sort of advocacy issue that advocates had dealt with. Um, I think it was one of the other big ones was connections, connections to um, family, siblings, was another big theme. So I'm trying to think because I just saw the list. Um, health services and support. So all the um, all kinds of advocacy issues around sort of medical services, mental health supports, um, those kinds of things were another big theme that we saw last sort of over the last year. I don't think any of that is surprising. I think um, Lots of those things are big themes that have been around for a while. And also we're seeing just big picture for lots of kids. Um, any questions about our individual advocacy? I'm going to do the awkward pause again, and then I'm going to check the time. And I have a quick video that I can show about our advocate, sort of that. And I'm a little more prepared this time. I cleaned up my behind the scenes. Here we go. Just give it two secs to make sure it all loads for you. And this one's a little shorter. It's about just under five minutes, I think. The first time that we called the OCYA, we were wanting to maintain connection with our two youngest brothers who were going to be adopted and we felt like we our voices were not heard. We have 12 siblings and I think just with that we just have a, such a strong bond together yeah. that um, it didn't matter where we went as long as we were there as a family that's all that mattered. And that's where Sandra stepped in. and. She's just been absolutely incredible. I can remember walking into this house with this big table with all these um, chairs. I knew I wanted to make sure I heard everybody to ensure that they all had something, you know, that if they had something to say, they got to say it and how they wanted to say it. Individual advocacy is supporting young people who receive services from the Ministry or Youth Justice in order to resolve concerns that they have. They may not be um, being heard. They may not um, feel that their rights are being upheld. And so as an advocate, we come along and support them and stand up for them. She just listened. And, you know, before that we'd been told, like, this is what's happening, this, you know. And Sandra came in and she asked us, so what would you like to see happen? What are your goals? And that was incredible to us because like before that, you know, we felt like our voices really didn't matter. Things weren't going well at home for them and they would come and tell us and, you know, we would make the calls and then after some time they took the children out and they were going to be separated. And um, we just, my husband and I had no children and it was kind of like <laughs> when they all walked in, it was so sweet. and. Uh, once they were there for two weeks, they weren't going anywhere. No way. <laughs>
I mean, if you think about young people coming into care, for example, and, and they may have siblings who they have lived through some very difficult times with, and they may be separated, and they don't have a say in whether that or not that happens or how that happens, that's critically important. It's a good example of, of where we see advocacy as being an important, uh, an important measure to take so that young people are heard. One of the key ingredients is to recognize that young people have a voice and that they have the right to, to be heard and the right to have their viewpoints considered. When we think about that and we create space for that to happen, you know, there's kind of like two things that come to my mind very readily and, and that is accommodation in space. So to go accommodate what a young person is hopeful to, to have happen in their life and to, and to hear what they have to say, um, but also to create the space for them to feel comfortable to say it, to have the kind of relationship that enables them to feel safe, to say some things that might be very difficult for them to say. Uh, those two things are critically important and, and anybody can do that. It's not something that takes a specific set of skills that are specialized. Anybody with an interest and, and who cares about young people can in fact create that accommodation in space. I remember Sandra came in and she had pamphlets of rights that children have. I remember thinking like, wow, I, I have rights. Like, how cool. Nobody, you know, had really before that told me like, Eva, your rights matter, you have rights. I would say to Sandra, uh, you have made such a difference in my life and helped me to find my voice and told me my voice matters and I can't ever thank you enough for that. She's had just a phenomenal impact on the lives of 12 children and even though it's just me and my sister sitting here right now that there's so much more of us that appreciate what she's done for our family. This is something that we as an organization and I think we as a as a community and as a province need to know that young people can come out of ad adversity and out of trauma and be very successful people with the supports of the natural people um, around them. If you have a concern and your concern is something that you don't think you can manage yourself, um, please call us to see if there's something that we can do to help. The OCYA has been an incredible help in my life, in the life, lives of my family, you know, my siblings. And uh, if nothing, call and see the options you have and have someone in your corner. It's, it's nice to have someone in your corner and have your voice heard. So, um, a couple things about that video. The 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 things I actually like about that video and our old provincial advocate. He's actually not our provincial advocate anymore, but videos are very expensive, and he has lots of good things to say. So, we're still using them. Is really he talks about like um, anyone can do advocacy for kids, and and we truly believe that. I've seen that um, often. I used to be in our intake team for a very long time and people would call up caregivers workers and and be like okay we really need your help and then I'd say well what what have you done so far what's happened so far and people have done tons of advocacy already ton like and um and really that we don't own the market share on advocacy we're definitely not the only advocates in kids lives um by a mile and so um we really please know we recognize all the hard work people are doing and that there's lots of people in lots of systems advocating for kids. Um, all right. So mindful of time, we'll get quick back at it. I might quick move through a couple of the next ones. Um, there we go, video. So out of sort of all of our other advocacy work, our investigations, um, our legal um, representation and individual advocacy, we see um, lots of 
I uh, different issues that are actually impacting lots of young people or a group of young people. And so our office also does systemic advocacy, which is big picture advocacy, essentially, where really you're trying to change something in a system, um, in a big system or systems. Um, and so part of our systemic advocacy could is the recommendations in our investigative reviews um, as well in our individual advocacy, um, sometimes we might see an issue where over a couple of months, we're getting a number of calls about something um, happening for a number of young people. And then we might um, start to think about, okay, how can we talk to the decision makers? Often it's children's services and about the issue that has we're now seeing and raise concerns. And so that's sort of more informal systemic advocacy. And then um, we also do really formal systemic advocacy. So we release um, special reports at different times that focus on um, issues or a group of issues that are young, are impacting young people. We release them publicly. Um, we do media releases and essentially try and put pressure on different government bodies to make substantial change. And so um, some of our previous sort of special reports we've looked at um, is the overrepresentation, and I and also keeping in mind that some of these issues are still even now ongoing, um, the overrepresentation of Indigenous young people in care. Um, in the um, we did a special report on that um, a number of years ago. Uh, we've looked a couple of times at sort of the the issues around young people transitioning out of care into young adulthood. So that sort of aging out of care and sort of what's going on around supports and things like that. We're currently working on a. Um, special report looking at disabilities and the supports that young people are receiving who are in care and involved with the justice system. Specifically in the justice system, um, a few years ago, we looked at, um, did released a special report and did a bunch of work with recommendations around the use of segregation and OC spray or pepper spray essentially, but it's a very strong pepper spray. And so, um, and just in the last, four months have seen um, some significant policy change happen in the Edmonton Young Offender Center and the Calgary Young Offender Center around um, the use of segregation and pepper spray. So, um, and we really look to not just young people. We always want to hear from young people about an issue and what's happening and what they think isn't working what is working and what would make it better. But we also want to hear from the adults around those young people, because you also have a unique lens around what are the issues behind the scenes that maybe young people would just wouldn't know because they don't work in the system in the same way. And sorry, I'm just going to quickly catch up on, on the, um, uh, on the thing, how do you keep Indigenous siblings together in your work? So um, I guess really it would come from um, if often it would be our individual advocacy side and if we were seeing a lack of con connections where younger kids weren't visiting or connecting, an advocate might take that on as an advocacy issue to try and advocate they should be placed together, more visits, those kinds of things. It's very, and then for older kids, really, it would be if they're telling us, I want to see so-and-so, I want to be placed with so-and-so, I haven't seen my sister, brother, or and not just siblings, but, and so really, it's hard to say because there's no prescriptive this case always goes this way all of our files are very different because circumstances are different um sorry i'm gonna go my so i apologize my messages are showing up very strange today um speak with child children look to see who's connected to child 
teacher, coach, friends, parents, band designate, family members, etc. Um, we do, yeah. Oh, I see. Sorry. So it was a question out to all of you. Very cool. Sorry, I misunderstood. Um, it's probably, I can say that sibling piece, that's been an ongoing challenge for a long time. And the and the lack of connection and 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 making sure kids stay connected to their siblings. Um, and then now with what's going on with placements, it's even I imagine even more challenging more recently. So I'm just gonna quick check the time. Really quickly, uh, part of our um our role also is to promote and raise awareness about the rights of young people, which is challenging sometimes in a big, huge province. So we do lots of training, attending lots of different events um, to try to raise awareness about um, our office, children's rights. And then we also are always trying to build advocacy capacity in communities. So we offer free workshops, advocacy one-on-one workshops, um, in our youth and community engagement, we also, we have an actual youth engagement division that um, helps support um, our youth council. We have youth interns, and we also have an indigenous engagement um, area, like staff and a knowledge keeper. Actually, um, since COVID, so our knowledge keeper came on board with us since COVID and really, um, has actively been trying to build capacity within our organization um, to support Indigenous young people. Um, so tons of cultural things and also as a real resource to the young people we work with. So um, he actually um, hosts sweats on his property. And so um, young people who work with us in different at different times have the opportunity to attend sweats um, and is sort of available as any of our staff are working with a young person. If a young person wants to connect with our knowledge keeper, uh, we're just, it's behind schedule, like everything, are finishing a cultural room in our office tower downtown so we can hold ceremony um, right in our space. So we're really excited about that. Um, so if you're ever interested in any of our courses or training or want to connect please reach out and we can see what we can figure out. And I think that's it. I had one video. Um, I'm going to stop the share to wrap up, but I should stop real quick and ask, is there any other questions, thoughts? Erin, you made no sense there. Please try and explain that better. I'm also okay with that. Oh, awkward pause. Sunshine, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, I know that there is an Indigenous worker, at least, um, when I, uh, like, I don't know, a few months ago, like, Ken Armstrong. Yeah, that's our um, knowledge keeper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was just wondering um, if you could explain more about the Indigenous um, support like that, if you could just talk about their roles, what they offer Indigenous youth, that would be great. Yeah, so I think, so with Ken, I guess it's um, one offering sort of opportunity, like to the youth we're working with, they have access to Ken to meet with Ken. I know Ken, our Knowledge Keeper has gone out with some different advocates at different times um, to meet with young people. He really approaches it from his dance is along with is that our staff really should um, participate and experience as much many different teachings and cultural activities as possible to try and pave the way that if we're really comfortable with medicine picking or going in a sweat that that somehow we can help support young people to be willing to explore that more if it's new for them or mm -hmm. um and then our Indigenous engagement staff really do everything from going out into community to do presentations, attending events, 
this summer, it wasn't as much as other summers cultural camps. In previous summers, we've gone to a number of different cultural camps and done like activities with the young people. Um, truthfully, right now we're looking for a new Indigenous engagement staff in the North office. So we have someone in the South. So lots of connecting um, with community leaders. Oh, also um, elders. So um, helping us uh, connect to different elders um, for different events and things that we're doing. We have elders involved with our investigative reviews as part of the review process. So I'm just thinking, uh, how do you find knowledge keepers? What protocol do you offer? Oh, good question. Truthfully, we did it very Western in that we had a job ad for our knowledge keeper, which then there was a whole discussion about that. I'll be truthful. And so I don't think we've figured that all out yet. Uh, and protocol really can help sort of steer us and really for protocol for us, we really ask the elder what they would like for protocol. Um, we do lots of tobacco but in different ways, uh, cloth. Um, yeah. But Ken is very much trying to help us find our way or support us. So it's exciting and we're, it's just still pretty new for us. Any other questions? I know it's time for you guys to go and have a break. Thank you so much for taking the time to spend time with me and invite and the invitation, it is always very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. So we are all are learning, um, you know, working with indigenous people. Um, we all are learning. It's like, I'm, I'm still learning. I've been here 15 years and I, you know, in plain screen, one common word we say is magi go eskete, which means I don't know. I don't, I don't know anything. Magi go escape in. I'm I'm still learning, like because this is not written in a book, um, and um, reciprocity is important. So every morning um, today before our session began, Jerry Roasting. Jerry Roasting is another Cree teacher here. Um, he did the smudging ceremony and he prayed for us. And um, for protocol, um, you know, I I offered him tobacco and. I also um, had some food, well, you know, with me. I always give them fruit, fru fruits. Uh, I always keep lots of fruits with me, oranges, apples, bananas, and whenever um, uh, any elder comes, we it's part of the culture that we eat together. We offer food, you know. Uh, reciprocity is extremely important, and in the Western way, it's okay to ask ask him question, you know, like we are encouraging you. But if we are doing it in the indigenous way. You have to offer protocol when you meet a knowledge keeper. And um, um, Aaron mentioned the protocol. You know, it's okay to ask an elder um, the, that it's okay to ask in question that I need help with so and so information. Will you be willing to help? Uh, so, one, you're asking permission if uh, they're willing to share knowledge. We have many specialized knowledge keepers. When I was asking about genealogy, if you want to know information about genealogy in Matsukuchi's or fam family ties, the person to contact is Merwin Little Child. He's our walking encyclopedia. Of course, you can read uh, and look at family connections um, with the list, um, like residential school list or family name list, um, which are which is available openly in museums. If you're approaching a knowledge keeper and an elder, then you need, you have to offer something. It's more than tobacco or prints. Um, it's food, gas, because they have to pay their bills too. But the point is there are uh, specialized knowledge keepers. It's not uh, within the community. People know who's who knows which kind of ceremony, like who knows. Right now we have chicken dances, uh, many chicken dances in our community going on and ghost dances and there is a significance behind each dance which families uh, conduct um, you know these small families these gatherings Muscuchis, there are many many ceremonies always going on in Muscuchis. sun dances start uh, end of may and uh, on fridays when this, there are four different sun dances hosted because there are four different nations uh, over here uh, john 
used the technique of singing a sundance song um kesi go which he was singing yesterday um, and then he built his interpretation around the song jerry sadubak said the same thing that um you know he can take the western way and share the indigenous um, perspectives um so i think that you know as a process that can be done you know we go and but the point i'm trying to make across is it's okay in the white um, in the monia or mainstream society to ask the question you know and that's quite normal but with the cree or indigenous ways um you can say that i need information about some x y z um your topic will um is it okay with you and if the person is a knowledge keeper is willing to share the information they'll say yes i can share the information so you're asking first step what it's like your need you have the information need and you you're informing the person about your question and if they are the knowledge keeper they are the experts they'll help you if they are not the knowledge keepers they will be very pleased to direct you um you know to the other knowledge keeper and that's the snowball technique within these elders they are very respectful about each other and um, the expertise which they have um and each one of them they may be a career for some type of song bundles there are so many um lullabies you know family lullabies lullabies in the the songs uh, which you sing to children or the youth or the opening songs there are many um, welcome songs honor songs celeb- you know celebrating on different occasion songs uh, which which exist within the families and um, certain information is only shared with some specific people at specific time um, and once the person agrees that they are willing to share the knowledge then we have to do the protocol like it's it's not just you can ask a question or do a google search and get the answer if you're approaching a knowledge keeper reciprocity is important even if like i usually offer fruit i do not always offer tobacco or sage um, uh, on everyday regular basis and what i have seen is that if i have given a colleague of mine um fruit like a pear or something i'll give they'll come back and give me more like you know giving does not mean that you, know, you are becoming poor or you are losing something giving gifting is the culture you know so a colleague of mine i gave him my lunch yesterday he brought this for me <laughs> um, so even when we are working if you are working with indigenous people give um you know you can give a chocolate you can give a fruit um uh, please i had to learn this uh, <laughs> i'm from india but i had to learn this uh, about reciprocity that um you know uh, even little things you know you can you can give away like giving gifting is the culture now gifting giving um is always done in all the ceremonies i have been to you know uh, in or in most of the ceremonies in powwows round dance tea dances uh, strawberry dance Uh, chicken dances people give away like rites of passage ceremony so when um um young girl gets her first menstruation cycle there are rites of passage ceremony for uh, men too and tomorrow john kair uh, will share more about it so i'll keep for the men uh, for boys um uh, you know information for john to share but for rites of passage there are four days so when the lady when a girl gets her first menstruation cycle uh for four days she does not look at the mirror she's surrounded by her aunties or it's the mother who organizes uh, the rites of passage ceremony for the young girl mm. the young girl she's being taught how about her identity how to about her roles and how to conduct herself in public like you know um the distance to keep from different people um and she's learning the skills she's you know she's uh, learning how to sew how to make a ribbon skirt or a bag she's learning how to make banner soup or um different types of soup the rice raisin soup and on the fourth day the aunties invite other people in the community um to bless the girl four days this girl is not looking at camera or cell phone or tv or mirror uh, or and that's to the reason is that if she's looking at a mirror she'll always be looking at a mirror and see how beautiful she is but she needs to have the skills um look if you learn how the sewing skill you know you can put food on the table if you learn beading skills it'll help you 
So these four intense days, um, the, the mother calls the sisters, aunties, elders, knowledge keeper, and they all are with the girl. She's not in contact with any, any men, even from her own family. Um, and the last day, the family is for women only. And the knowledge keepers and aunties uh, who helped Kokums, Muslim, Kokums, not Muslim, Kokum uh, means their grandmother who helped um, teach the young girl about the role of woman and how powerful she is. Um, um, when they're having a ceremony, they're also showcasing um, the skills the girl learned, you know, uh, the banner she made. So the girl is making the food for the feast. Now in many um, Oskayat, like the children, the youth um, who are in uh, under your, um, you know, under your care, they may not have the rites of passage ceremony, or you know, they would have missed it. It's okay; they can have it later on their life and learn these skills. And you can approach a resident elder um, and do the protocol um, because they learn a lot of skills from these four days of rites of passage uh, ceremony. Um, which is separate for young girls and it is separate for boys. So uh, thank you so much for listening to me. The Thank you, Erin, for presenting uh, about advocacy, how important it supports which are needed and for um, um, you know, rights of the child. It's a very busy day for you all. Rita Cutknife, who will be presenting at one o'clock and she's at the college, I have seen her. The session will not be recorded and she would not like to share her slides, and that's okay. We respect the knowledge keepers if they do not want the session to be recorded. Um, and um, uh, Rita is, she's done many rites of passage ceremonies. She's a leader also. She's She translated the constitution for the Samson Cree nation. So she is, uh, knows how to write very well. And she's taught Cree, and she's still teaching Cree here at the college, and I, she, her technique is different. She goes by syllabic syllable. So say tos kota to when. This is how she'll teach by clapping. Se tos koto se tos kota to when, which means a collective. Uh, a collective, you know, like different there are different learning teaching methodologies of different knowledge keepers. John Clare likes to use songs, um, sundance songs or other songs and do an interpretation. Now, Rita Cutknife um, is she gets people really involved, um, and um, she'll make each person say repeat because repeating, 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 um, and she creates a very safe environment. You know, for adults to learn the language or for anyone to learn the Cree language, it has to be a very safe environment where we are allowed to make mistakes, and people will not laugh at you. Um, so, Erin, you can see so many thank yous for you, um, okay. and then today. Rita will do one hour presentation. After her presentation, we invited Suzanne. Now, Suzanne is a well-known, very well-known writer. She is, her published uh, her book called Legacy, which is published even in Germany and in, and in even in Chinese languages, in multiple different languages. So she's a young adult writer. She's done lots of work with healing. Um, and uh, she, she will be with us. So you can ask any questions you have She's partly indigenous, but in this training, as you have noticed, we welcome everyone. You know, it's two fat, two people coming together, two different worldviews coming together too. Um, so see you at 1 p.m. Enjoy your uh, break. And I hope uh, these videos are edited by our IT department, or I can send the unedited transcripts to you all because there is so much story and knowledge which is shared and we cannot retain uh, you know, everything which is shared yesterday, um, you know, like I went with the spirit and there's so much well sent. I'll, I'll email those either unedited transcripts to you tonight for sure. And those YouTube videos uh, will be loaded, uh, uploaded on MCC's uh, college uh, YouTube channel. But it's not everybody cannot view it. They need that specific link. And the reason we are using YouTube with a private link to share with you all so that it is easy to access um, if we share through Google Drive, some of you were having issues in downloading it. That's why we are using YouTube. If you have a better way to suggest on how we can share content information with you, please tell us. Please. Any questions, comments? Namoya? Namoya means no. Eha is yes.
and uh, you know this uh, we speak with the lips this is how you'll see the youth speak you know when you ask them about directions or anything so this lip language is quite um, common uh, sign language lip lang lip a lip you know pointing your lips here um, in muskutis so exit well let me do the the prayer which we have been doing uh, and the reason why i'm repeating it so many times is even listening to the sound and it's the way we are saying thank you honoring all of you um, in this learning circle saying thank you to erin saying thank you to the creator nota vinam se manto savehi minam uchi nan mina kana vei mina anuj gagisidak niyanan kita vasini sak na pewak pesisak iskwe wak iskwe sak ekwa kahkio kotagak I see ni work ota aski hek kita tamina I I uh, thank you so much and we'll meet at one p.m. Exe, moist. Bye bye and everyone. Erin, yes, uh, Erin, I look forward to receiving the yeah 